Let's take a look at the interface, the console for the Audient ID22, which is really probably what makes this thing unique, the most unique, actually, I would say. So let's take a look at what's going on here. You've got control over Q mixes. You've got a QA and a QB. What do you use those for? Well, you can decide what you want to send out of those cues to send someplace else. We might also call those auxiliary sends. So if we go to our channel view and let's say we'll hide the doll mixes for now because you can hide them and get them out of the way. You can show optical inputs which us in voiceover will probably never use because you can see you get a lot more inputs if you're using the optical ADAT inputs. And we'll just make sure we see only the mic line inputs for now. And then we'll click the system button Boom, check that out. Now we have control over our, our routing matrix, which is the real business end of this unit, which makes it so unique. So what can you do with these cue mixes? Well, you can determine exactly what signals go where. So let's say you have a Zephyr plugged in to send one on the back of the unit. Then you can route only audio from, let's say, the main mix, or what only comes from, say, cube A, and send that out to the Zephyr. So it's incredibly flexible that way because of these queue functionalities and how you can choose where those queues are going to feed. And we can choose whether they're going to be stereo or mono. And uh, you can pan things from left to right, which you probably rarely will need to do. So it's very, very flexible that way. The optical inputs can also be SPDIF, which may be more useful if you're using a mic preamp that has an SPDIF optical output on it. Then you can change it to just a stereo SPDIF input. Same with the output. If you're going to record a backup to another device via SPDIF. Clock source, you would only use that if you're going to take a digital input from something else. Then you could change the source to uh, optical. Talkback, you can choose any of these sources as the talkback mic. So some of you may use that, most of you probably won't, but you can choose mic 2 to be talkback. And then when you press the talkback button, that will trigger that microphone's mic and mute the... Uh, that will trigger that microphone and dim the speakers so you won't get any feedback. Very clever. You can choose how mono works, what you're going to hear when you press the mono button right here. And then you've got trims for the dim and for the alt outputs. So let's say you have a second set of speakers hooked to the alternate output and they're a lot louder than the mains. You can, you can trim them to match exactly right with the trim control. And the dim control you can adjust exactly how much volume went out of the dims. And of course the dim is variable, so if you want the dim to dim more or less, you can control that here. And once you've laid out your whole system, you just click save and save the whole thing as a preset right here to recall later. One last really nifty thing, we'll go ahead and hide the system panel. Open up the doll mixes. So what's doll mixes? This lets you take the playback from your recording software and route it someplace else. Again, if you're using a Zephyr for a phone patch or using Skype plugged in, through analog inputs and outputs on the back of the audience, you can route playback from the DAW to that external uh, interface. So very, very cool. Very, one of the few systems I've seen that can do that and does it so gracefully. And last but not least, the fact that you can change the name of the inputs. So if you want it to say 416 and TLM 103, or whatever floats your boat, you can do that. The font's a little bit funny, but you'll get over it. It's supposed to look like somebody's handwriting. I'm not sure who. So anyway, that's the way the interface works. So back to the in-studio demo.